Okay, right. Thanks, everyone, for coming to this tech talk today. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about media tech um, and what it's all about. I know the media tech uh, stream has been at, running from CC Group for a few couple of years now, but I know not a lot of you have worked on the stream or know much about the industry. So we're going to talk a bit more today about what the industry is, some of the trends, and then what it means to us at CC Group. So. First off, what is MediaTek? Um, for those of you that have been at CC Group a little while, you know that the stream used to be called BAMTech, Broadcast and Media Technology. Uh, we decided to change the name because Broadcast Media wasn't, didn't explain exactly what we wanted it to. So myself and Duncan uh, decided to change the name to MediaTek. Um, if you actually Google media tech, this is the definition that you come up with, a generic term that refers to various topics within media. See media, digital media, story technologies, multimedia, and DSP. So it's still not that clear what media tech is. Um, ultimately, there's a lot of different categories that fall under the media tech umbrella. So here are a few of them. You've got broadcast, entertainment, digital video, OTT, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, there's a lot of stuff. I'm going to go through some of these things in a bit more detail later on. Um, and before I go on, any questions, feel free to jump in, interrupt. Any difficult questions, head of media tech is sat just there. <laughs> <laughs> so, with so many different things coming under media tech, uh, we decided to come up with our own definition for what media tech means for us at CC Group. So, for us, media tech refers to the technology that supports content owners and content service providers in the production and delivery of video. It's a pretty broad spectrum, so anything from the moment that you capture a piece of video live, if it's a sports match, the news, all the way through to watching it on your phone or your laptop or your TV. So we split the, the term down even further into three different categories. The first one is content acquisition, which is essentially getting the video in the first place. So capturing video on a camera, so if you're recording a football game, anything like that, getting that onto a camera into the right format so then it can be ready for distribution and be watched on TV or any other devices. So companies that fall under the content acquisition umbrella are people that do things like uh, that create um, or manufacture cameras, they do things like video compression, video editing, video transcoding and encoding, which is essentially turning a file into the right format <clears throat> so that you can watch it on the internet or on a different device. So after content acquisition, we then have content delivery, which is once that file or video is ready, how you get it to the end user, the end viewer. Um, Companies that fall under this umbrella are people that do media asset management, so getting them the video ready. Um, people that do metadata tagging, so assigning data to pieces of video. So if you've got a film with um, Hugh Grant in it, add the metadata tags to it. Um, or if you've got something in the news like Donald Trump and you want to show a clip of when Donald Trump was in the news last week, you would assign a tag and then it just makes it easier for broadcasters to pull up the video. And then you've got online video players, um, content delivery networks, who I know a few of you will know a bit about content delivery networks. So it's essentially anything that helps with the transport and the delivery of video to the viewer. And then our final category is content consumption, which is all about enhancing the user experience, the viewer experience. So this will be things like personalization and recommendation. So uh, often on Netflix, you'll get because you watch Black Mirror and it will suggest a load of other things to you. Um, or it'll be things like app, like with the X Factor, you can download the app and it gives you like behind the scenes content or exclusive games, you can vote, things like that. So content consumption is essentially anything that makes the experience better for the user. So they're the three categories of uh, company that we work with at CC Group. Any questions or no? Perfect. Cool. Right. So now spoke a little bit about what MediaTek is at CC Group. Going to talk uh, a bit more about the evolution of TV and how um, how it's progressed over the years. So essentially, we've gone from this, 
which is a family sat around the TV in the living room at a certain time, um, say six o'clock to watch the news on a black and white TV. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that boy is doing. I don't know if he's like levitating or something. But... Uh, and we've gone to this. So being able to watch video on your phone, on the move, you're not stuck to the living room anymore. To this, you can watch TV on more than one screen. You don't have to watch one piece of content at once. I don't know, people scroll through Instagram whilst they're, uh, they're watching TV. Um, and we've had a lot of different stuff in the middle. Um, we've gone from black and white to colour, DVD, VHS, Blu-ray, teletext for uh, people that remember teletext. <laughs> um, we've got Freeview, 3D TV, which never really took off that much, um, Ultra HD TV. Um, and there's also potential for us to go to this which is watching TV with VR headsets and having a more immersive experience. So how have we got from the family watching the black and white TV to where we are today? Um, so here's a little bit of history on uh, the evolution of TV. So firstly, we had broadcast or terrestrial television, which is... Um, signals transmitted over the air waves um, and then received by an antenna on the TV. Um, broadcast was the first um, form of television broadcasting. Um, the first long distance television broadcast was from Washington DC in 1927. Uh, the BBC started broadcasting in 1929 and then it had a, a full schedule of programmes up and running by 1930. Um, so after broadcast, we then had cable television, which came in around the 1950s and 1960s, which, as the name suggests, signals delivered through a cable, um, either coaxial cables or through more recently fibre optic cables. Those who work in telecoms should know all about those different kind of cables. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then there was satellite television, which uh, came a lot more mainstream in the 1980s, which is communication via satellites that orbit the Earth and then received by satellite, which is often on the roof of your house. Um, and then we had the digital switchover, which was all about um, replacing analog TV with digital TV, and that gave us free view. And then the internet came along and has changed things once again. So now we are in an internet TV age, and thanks to the internet, we can all be that girl on the bus watching EastEnders or Peaky Blinders or whatever it is, um, or those guys having loads of screens at once. So internet TV, I'm sure a lot of you all will be familiar with these different types of TV. Um, video on demand is kind of the main, I guess it's the main umbrella of internet TV. All the other categories that fall under internet TV are all flavours of video on demand. So video on demand does what it says on the tin, allows viewers to watch video as and when they want it. So things like all four, my five, if you missed first dates so Monday at eight o'clock or wherever it's on, you can watch it whenever you want. Um, catch up TV is a type of odd, and again, name pretty self-explanatory. You can catch up on something that you've missed, so you'd Catch-up TV is different to video on demand because you would have usually recorded it via a digital video recorder. So on your Virgin box or on Sky, you can click record and you can have a whole list of things that you've recorded and that you want to watch back or you'll have days of the week and you can go back and catch up on things like that. <clears throat> then you've got IPTV, which is Internet Protocol Television, which is delivering TV over, um, over the internet, but... IPTV is where it's delivered over privately managed networks, so these use content delivery networks. Um, you don't have to download a video, you'll stream them, and that's the reason that you've got a content delivery network, because it will ensure a better quality of service. Essentially, it will bring the content closer to the user, and it will make sure the service is better. It means you don't get the buffering wheel of doom every time you want to watch something. 
there's old pools here in the UK. We've got UView, Now TV, Virgin TV. And then the final one is Over the Top TV, or OTT TV. Um, and again, name does what it says on the tin. It's about going over the top of broadcasters or internet service providers and delivering TV services direct to the viewer. <coughs> so Netflix, prime example of, um, of something like that. Cool, and then we've got a bit of a, a timeline here of, um, of the different types of TV that we've had. There's obviously some overlap between a few of them. Cable and television are obviously still around today. Cable and satellite, sorry, are obviously still around today. Um, but with the advent of companies like uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix, a lot more of those traditional um, company, cable and satellite companies are looking to bring out internet TV services so that they can remain competitive in the market. Cool, right. Um, now, I'm going to talk a bit more about some of the trends in the industry. Um, I don't know if there were any questions before. Sorry, I keep forgetting to, <laughs> to ask that. No? Fab. Right. Industry trends. Got quite a few builds in here. So, first up is industry players. So, in terms of um, our perspectives and business-to-business -business communications, um, there's a lot of big players in the market and a lot of small companies. There's not really an in-the-middle type company. You've got massive massive players, lots of little players, um, and because of that you see a lot of consolidation and a lot of partnerships in the market. So you'll see a lot of the big companies acquiring a lot of the smaller companies, um, often in the news. Um, and then if you go to a trade show, for example, more often than not you'll go to a stand and you'll see partnerships and you'll see a whole load of logos on the stand and then you'll go to another company and you'll see they're, they're all partnered with the same people. <coughs> Um, because there's so many, try and work together to deliver more services. Um, and then in terms of the types of companies, they're kind of split into two focuses, really. You've got companies that help with the production of major content, um, and then you've got companies that create technology to help deliver that content to the end users. There's a lot of, always a lot of um, discussion around like content is king, and if is it the content that's actually the driver for people to watch services, or it actually is it a package service which offers um, a good price, is um, has lots of different content, but is personalised? You can watch like across different devices, all that kind of stuff. So after industry plays, you've got technology. So it's a lot of good innovative companies in the market, but not very good differentiation. So there's a lot of, me too, we do that too. Um, if you go to a trade show and you walk up to a booth of a company you might not have heard of before, and you're like, oh, tell me a bit about yourself, what do you do? 99% guarantee they'll come back to you and say, we're a multi-screen OTT cloud TV provider. End-to-end, like, -end, yes, end-to-end -end cloud multi-screen TV provider. And you're a bit like, OK, so is everyone else here. So what is it that you actually do? Um, a lot of companies in the industry as well are slow to adopt new technology. So things like the cloud and um, big data and machine learning have been spoken quite a lot in different um, industries like enterprise tech. Cloud has been there, done that, where it's, it's a relatively new technology to the media tech industry. So there's still a lot of talk about that and a lot of talk about migrating to the cloud. And then finally, um, major technology transition to IP. This is um, something that's really big in the media tech industry and is where a lot of crossover <coughs> is between media tech and telecoms. So um, as, te as telcos have uh, laid the networks, broadcasters are essentially using those networks to, uh, to deliver video. <laughs> There's also a big transition as well for um, companies that will have, um, like, they'll have rooms that are filled head to floor with, like, video files and about getting them onto the internet, getting them into the cloud. So that's also a major technology transition for them as well. In terms of economics, so um, the old business model for TV doesn't really work anymore, thanks to the likes of Netflix and um, internet TV service providers. So traditionally, you'd have a TV service, you'd pay 20, 30 pound a month, and you'd get 
a set of channels. Um, now that doesn't really work, you can get different types of bundles, you can get a light, you can get a super deluxe, um, and you can add on different things like you, you might want to add on kids channels, you might want to add on films, you might want to add on TV, you might want to add on sport, you might want to add HD channels and options. Um, so, which means that actually offering a bog standard for £8 a month for X amount of channels doesn't really work anymore. <coughs> also doesn't work when you could get Netflix for 5 99 a month. Um, it's going on from some of the uh, talking a bit about the big players and the small companies. It's a massive market, but fragmented, so there's lots and lots of companies competing for the same slice of pie, essentially. And then, as mentioned, telcos getting in on the action as well. So telcos have laid the IP networks, so they're starting to look at how they can actually use those networks and monetize them. There's a lot in the news at the moment about AT&T and Time Warner. I don't know how much of that many any of you know, but um, <clears throat> essentially um, AT&T are looking to acquire Time Warner. It's a massive deal for the media tech industry because AT&T would have um, a huge monopoly over the market. It's actually at trial at the moment. I think it's been at trial for about four weeks, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and um, there's, the, basically the reason it's gone to trial is because they're worried that with them owning so much of the market, <coughs> they'll put up prices, and so consumers won't have an option but to, to pay more prices. Um, and just to give some perspective of how big a deal that is, my notes. Um, so if the acquisition was to happen, AT&T would essentially own HBO, which has Game of Thrones and Westworld. It would own Turner Broadcasting Channels, it would um, have TV content like The Sopranos and Wire. It would own CNN. It would have the rights to Major League Baseball. And it would also own, did I say CNN? I said CNN. And it would also own potentially Warner Brothers as well. So it would it would own a lot, basically. That's what. Yeah, that's the telecoms company, yeah, owning all of that in the media industry. <laughs> And then, finally, we've got geographies. So a lot of the major movers, major companies, are based in the US. Um, IP, again, is a big deal in the media tech industry. Um, it, it basically means that broadcasters and content owners have global reach. Also means as consumers, we get access to more content. So if we want to watch US TV and films, we can. If you're in Italy and you want to watch an African TV program, you can. Um, it basically gives broadcasters a bigger audience and it gives consumers more options. So it kind of evens out the playing field. And then finally, China is um, starting to disrupt the market as well. Um, for any football fans, you'll know that some of the major games are now played a lot earlier so that the Asian market can actually watch football games. Um, and of course, with such a massive population, why wouldn't broadcasters want to have their content seen by, seen by um, China? So that is that. Um, so what else is in store for the media tech industry? Um, virtual reality is uh, really starting to make traction um, in the mass TV and film market. It was once held the, th the next 3D TV, but actually some big companies are making a big play in virtual reality. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen or heard about the film Coco. Yeah. <laughs> um, if for those of you that don't know, it's about this. It's an animated Disney Pixar film. Um, it's about this 12-year-old boy that accidentally gets um, transported to the world of the dead, and um, he has to try and make his way back. Um, Pixar actually made its debut into VR with the film Coco. Um, so you can put on your virtual reality headset and you can like explore the world of the dead. Would it be a media tech tech talk if I didn't let you all watch a video? So um, I'll, put, I'll put the trailer on, if this works. No, I can't get the volume to work, but... Oh, yeah, that's true. No. I don't know if 
but I, looking at that it always makes me feel a bit queasy. Cool. Okay. Uh. Cool, yeah, and then touch upon Hulu's couple of projects as well. Um, then other trends, augmented reality, um, it's often become a big trend like uh, VR, it's the mix between the real world and the digital world. Um, I don't know how many of you know about Pokemon Go, but perfect example, um, being able to use your smartphone to catch Pokemons. Um, uh, Zara have also recently launched an AR campaign, I think it was launched this week or last week, um, where if you walk past a shop window and you see something or you're in store, you can use your phone to scan it and it will take you to the website so you can buy it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then other really popular trend is actually esports, which is something that really fascinates me. So esports is essentially watching people in video game competitions. So um, it's actually a really huge market. It's meant to be a market worth a billion pounds by 2021. And the, the amount of people watching esports is actually taken over the amount of people watching regular sports. Just to put in perspective how massive a market this actually is. Um, it's huge. Uh, and then on to the final section, I think, of, um, of the talk, which is kind of coming back full circle to more about media tech at CC Group. So um, just thought I'd tell you all a bit more about what it is uh, Duncan and I do, uh, some of the events that we go to, um, and how the media tech stream actually fits in with some of the other streams we have. So... Our stream timetable, there's loads of events throughout the year, so I've just picked out the most important ones. February is Mobile World Congress. I've spoken, oh, I've gone back. Um, I've spoken a lot about how the world between telecoms and broadcast um, are coming together. Mobile World Congress is actually an important event for media tech industry as much as it is for telecoms, essentially because people are broadcasting their video over IP networks, but also because you can now watch video on your mobile phone, so a bit of a crossover. And then things like 5G and Wi-Fi as well are all relevant in the delivery of video. April is NAB in Las Vegas, which we all know how much Duncan and I like going to Las Vegas, the city of dreams. Um, a massive North American show. Um, as I mentioned, US is um, a big deal in the media tech industry, um, a lot of European companies, a lot of Asia companies have a presence at the show there, so that is uh, one of the most important ones. May, you've got TV Connect in London, which is mainly a European event, it's a lot smaller, um, it's at the XL in London. Then in June, you've got Media Tech 360, which is an event run by um, trade publication TVB Europe. Um, this event is a bit different to some of the other ones. It tries to concentrate on some of the newer trends in the industry, so things like artificial intelligence and esports. Then our other big one is um, IBC in September in Amsterdam. So this is a massive European event, but much like NAB, there's a big North American presence. There's a lot of Asia companies that exhibit there. Pretty big show, 14 halls, um, lots and lots of exhibitors. There, so your now know where me and Duncan get busy during the year and when we're and when we're not around. And then final part is just um, talking a bit more about how media tech fits into the other streams. So all of the streams are pretty interlinked. So I know a lot of our telecoms clients, for example, have an enterprise play or they might have a have a fintech play. So just talking a bit more about how media tech fits into those streams. So enterprise tech, you heard me mention a couple of times content delivery networks. They're not just to help with the quality of service for video. They can help with websites and applications. So hence the enterprise tech um, angle there and CD networks, um, content delivery networks that actually specializes um, in um, quality of service for businesses. Then you've got telecoms. I've rabbited on a bit about how the world of telecoms and media tech um, 
really are coming together. Um, transition to IP, 5G, Wi-Fi, all of that great stuff. And then fintech. Um, you've got subscription services like Netflix now, so payments for those. And then tra transactional video on demand as well. So, so if you want to watch the boxing, you normally do a one-off payment there. And then obviously supporting payments across lots of different devices as well. Something that um, is growing in the media tech industry.